So as we move into the mid to late 19th century, we are going to focus in uh, specifically on developments in France uh, for just a moment here. So this work, The Birth of Venus by Alexandre Cabanel, really exemplifies the tastes of the Académie des Beaux-Arts in the mid 19th century. Cabanel won the Prix de Rome in 1845, and then he won top honors at the Salon three times in the 1860s and 70s. This particular work was a huge hit at the 1863 Salon, and it was actually purchased by the Emperor Napoleon III. Um, so here in Cabanel's version of this very popular mythological story, Venus lies quite centrally atop the waves, while these little um, puti or cupid figures kind of fly above her. Um, so this really demonstrates Cabanel's technical virtuosity and his highly refined neoclassical style, but the erotic subject matter kind of connects it firmly to more romantic interests. Um, he's really rendered um, the slightly foreshortened form of Venus with this highly idealized yet naturalistic anatomy and subtle chiaroscuro that really sort of models her soft rounded flesh, um, which is further emphasized by her sort of languid pose. Um, now the highly detailed scene is illuminated with this clear, even light, and Cabanel has created an illusionistic sense of depth using using, excuse me, both linear and atmospheric perspective. Um, there's a clear emphasis on the clarity of line and form, really furthered by the high level of surface finish and the absence of brush strokes. Um, and so this is really the style that the Academy or Beaux Arts was promoting, and they were still very much firmly in control of artistic professional success, um, and that was largely kind of monitored through the French Salon. The mid-19th century also, however, saw a wave of rebellion against the rules of the academy and the rise of the avant-garde. So the term avant-garde was used by French military units, meaning advance guard, or referring to the units that would go in advance of or sort of scout ahead of the rest of the army. The concept of the avant-garde refers to groups of independent radical thinkers who sought to break free from the norms of society and find new ways of thinking. The term was applied to Parisian artists first around 1831, after the Revolution of 1830, when many artists and architects saw themselves as working in advance of an increasingly bourgeoisie society and sought to break away from the Académie des Beaux Arts, um, its hierarchy of genres, and the sort of heroism and exoticism of the neoclassical and romantic styles. Now, this is not to say that academic and avant-garde arts are complete opposites. Rather, they sort of live side by side, with some academic artists being uh, quite experimentational and some avant-garde upholding certain academic conventions. Uh, Mid-19th century Paris was particularly plagued with violence, social unrest, overcrowding, and poverty. Uh, rising fruit, food prices, high unemployment, political disenfranchisement, and government inaction sparked the Revolution of 1848, which ultimately ended the July monarchy and established the Second Republic. However, continued conflicts led to further revolts, during which more than 10,000 working-class citizens were killed and in injured. And so it was during this incredibly unstable and violent period that the really the first new art movement of the 19th century was born, and that was realism. So realism with a lowercase r is a term that we often use sort of interchangeably with naturalism, and we use that to kind of refer to art that attempts to depict subjects in a way that's accurate to life without idealizing stylizing or distorting them. And that is, for the most part, true here. However, capital R realism refers to the specific movement that was born in France in the late 1840s. Uh, capital R realists really sought to depict the social reality or the circumstances of all classes, 
in the present, not in the past, and to treat them with equal attention without artificial emotions or relationships. Um, in some ways, uh, realism is a natural follower of romanticism, which often looked at the plight of the lower class or just the individual, um, and it responded to current events. But in general, realists sought to depict everyday and ordinary subjects rather than historic or heroic ones. So really, realism is not so much a unified style as it was a common commitment to depicting modern situations and subjects with truth and accuracy. And that includes the um, unsavory or brutal truths of life as well. One of the first to call himself both an avant-garde and a realist was Gustave Courbet, who was born in Ornans, France, and moved to Paris in 1839, where he witnessed the um, violent revolution of 1848, which really radicalized him. Courbet sought to align fine art with the modern world by replacing historical and mythological subjects with the truth of his personal experience, though in a rather objective way. He's quoted as having once said, I've never seen an angel. Show me an angel and I'll paint one. And by this he meant he couldn't paint what he had not seen or experienced for himself. So he strove for real, tangible, humble human subject matter, and he really refused to idealize, beautify, or romanticize. At the 1850 and 51 Paris Salon, Courbet presented two large-scale works that really exemplify realism. However, at the time, they were pretty shocking to academic audiences because of his choice to portray mundane subjects on a heroic scale, his uh, coarse or blunt treatment of the subjects, and his deliberately sort of unrefined style. So Courbet painted the first of these canvases, which is titled The Stonebreakers, in 1849. Um, again, this is a large scale canvas. It's about five feet by eight and a half feet. And that's um, a size that would have been typically reserved for heroic subjects and history paintings. Yet Courbet has depicted the harsh reality of working class laborers, specifically uh, performing the monotonous and backbreaking work. Um, of this young boy and this old man who are sort of crushing rocks into gravel uh, to put in road beds. Uh, so these are quite literally, as your book states, the disenfranchised peasants upon whose backs modern life was being built. Um, and so Courbet shows both of these figures with dirty, tattered clothing, um, though the boy does wear more modern trousers and laced work boots, while the older man wears a more traditional peasant outfit, including wooden clogs. Um, the older man seems almost too old for this type of work, and really he's probably spent his whole life doing this, um, and he sort of serves as a symbol of an increasingly obsolete rural past. The boy, on the other hand, almost seems too young for this kind of labor. He's really straining under the physical weight of this heavy rock, um, but he's really broken by the grim kind of reality of his future, which is being represented here by the older man. Courbet wrote about his inspiration for this composition, saying that near the town of Ornans, he encountered these two men breaking stones on the highway. Uh, he described them as, quote, the most complete expression of poverty, end quote. He stopped and sort of took time to acknowledge them. Um, he invited them back to his studio so that he could talk to them more and sort of study them for the painting. Um, Courbet also noted, quote, alas, in labor such as this, one's life begins that way and it ends the same way, end quote. And I really think he's emphasizing that idea here. Um, if you notice, the faces of both figures are turned away or sort of in deep shadow, and so the men remain anonymous, um, which sort of underscores how the upper classes ignored the plight of the poor. 
Um, also, notice how he's situated the figures against this low rocky hill with just this slip of the blue sky in the upper right corner. Um, so the figures are really sort of physically trapped or isolated in just the same way that they are trapped economically and socially. Uh, Courbet also uses this very somber, almost monochrome, earth-toned color palette, so the brown and gray tones of the figures really match the surrounding landscape and their forms almost blend in. Courbet also renders the composition with this characteristically rough brushwork, and in areas he uses a palette knife to create uh, sort of thickly crusted um, paint applications. Uh, so the surface texture here really implies the roughness of the landscape and the brutality of life, although it's also a sort of conscious rejection of the highly polished or finished neoclassical style, which again was the dominant style in French art at the time. Now, Recording these peasant laborers on such a large scale, Courbet is intentionally making a political statement, um, sort of arguing that these are the people who should be considered heroes. Uh, he's not sensationalizing things, however. He's just trying to present an accurate account of the common abuse and deprivation of French rural life and kind of show that the cost of upper class frivolity comes at the price of, you know, those who are already impoverished. Um, and, you know, Courbet himself simply described this as, quote, a portrayal of injustice. Um, unfortunately, though, this work um, no longer exists except for in reproductions or photographs uh, because I believe it was um, stolen by some Nazi soldiers during the, world, the Second World War um, and then it was uh, later destroyed when the vehicle transporting it uh, was bombed. The second of his two most influential works was painted just after Stonebreakers, and it's another sort of monumentally scaled canvas. Um, it's even larger, actually. It's about 10 feet tall by 22 feet wide. Um, and so this one is titled A Burial at Ornans. Um, again, Courbet came from a decently wealthy family in the small rural town of Ornans, and this scene was actually inspired by the 1848 funeral of his grandfather, who was um, a veteran of the first French Revolution in 1789. Now, this is not a sort of historical record of the funeral, and Courbet makes that clear by including a recognizable profile portrait of his grandfather at the far left of the composition. I think it's uh, this, this guy here, I think. Um, he also actually includes um, two other revolutionaries, these two men who are standing kind of to the right of the uh, grave here. These are meant to be other revolutionaries from his father's generation, or excuse me, from his grandfather's generation, kind of suggesting that it's one of their uh, contemporaries, one of their friends um, who is being buried. Um, your book kind of suggests that Courbet is maybe linking the revolutions of 1789 and 1848 because both sought to advance the cause of democracy in France. Um, now, again, he's not trying to dramatize the emotions of grief or idealize his figures. Um, he's not presenting us with any sort of spiritual or mystical vision. Instead, he's simply trying to show what we would actually experience at a rural graveside funeral like this. So he gives us this cluster of figures, uh, which includes, again, recognizable portraits, um, not only of his grandfather and um, the other revolutionaries, but um, of the mayor of Ornans, a judge, uh, the grave diggers, and several other uh, mourners in the crowd, um, kind of his heroes of everyday life here. Um, but he kind of groups them in this irregular frieze-like arrangement across the shallow horizontal space, um, and they're all sort of pressed rather tightly together and quite close to the front of the picture plane, and all of their heads are below the horizon line. 
Um, now, the burial hasn't happened yet, so people are sort of distracted, kind of turning in different directions. Some of them seem uh, sad, uh, but others look bored or maybe just indifferent. Some of them seem to be maybe contemplating the idea of mortality, um, but others kind of seem like maybe they're thinking about what they want to have for dinner after they're done here. Um, and then even this dog who seems to have just wandered up uh, to the event seems distracted, kind of looking away. Um, so Corbet, I think, really conveys the sort of awkwardly numb yet brutal emotional and kind of psychological and even physical reality of a funeral like this. And there's a certain democracy to how Corbet treats his figures, because each one is really a unique individual with their own personality and experience. Um, again, he's not trying to convey any type of moralizing message. Um, he doesn't depict any sort of Holy Spirit or, you know, transcendence. And the only outside religious references that he makes here um, are, you know, the things that are actually there. Uh, the priest, the bishops, the altar boy here on the left side of the composition, and then this uh, sort of standard bearing Christ on the cross that's silhouetted against the sky. And interestingly, really the only thing that kind of stretches above the horizon here. <clears throat> Also, notice in the foreground, kind of here at the right edge of the grave, we have this skull that lies in the dirt, uh, sort of revealing that in the process of digging the grave, someone long forgotten has been sort of uncovered and tossed aside. Uh, so this is sort of a memento mori or a reminder of death, um, but it's also a reminder of the sad reality of the passage of time, innovation, progress, etc. Um, so this and Stonebreakers were both exhibited at the Paris Salon of 1850 and 51, um, and he knew when he entered them that they would be sort of denounced. He was really purposefully uh, challenging the established academic conventions in terms of subject, style, and finish um, in order to create controversy and kind of establish uh, his position as a true avant-garde artist. Um, a couple years later, in 1855, Corbet's works were rejected altogether from the International Exposition, and after fighting with the person in charge, he very boldly rented a property right next door and built his own pavilion of realism, uh, and that really established him as uh, being independent of the Academy and the Salon. Uh, he created his own catalog and wrote a manifesto of realism, and in that he declared that his aim was to, quote, be in a position to translate the customs, the ideas, the appearance of my epoch according to my own estimation, end quote. Uh, so the press really had a field day with uh, his action there, and Courbet immediately became the most controversial artist in France, but he was also immediately incredibly influential. Another important French realist was Jean-Francois Millet. Um, he was like Courbet, he was sort of a political radical. Um, Millet grew up on a farm and though he lived and worked in Paris between about 1837 and 1848, he was never fond of urban life. Um, and then later after receiving a state commission and stipend for his part in the 1848 revolution, he actually moved to the rural village of Barbizon, which is south of Paris. And there he painted the social realities of the rural poor. So this work titled The Gleaners from 1857 is probably one of his best known. Um, so in the background we see this vast field where workers have gathered an enormous harvest kind of piled high in stacks and some of it has already been loaded kind of in tall piles on these uh, horse-drawn wagons uh, or maybe mule-drawn wagons perhaps. 
Um, but the focus of the composition is not the harvest in the background. Rather, it's the group of three women in the foreground who bend uh, quite deeply to search the ground for any stray grain. Uh, so gleaning was a form of relief offered to the rural poor by wealthy landowners, but it required hours upon hours of working, kind of stooped over like this, uh, carefully searching for whatever was left over or dropped, and usually they would find, you know, just enough grain to make maybe a single, just small loaf of bread. So Mie depicts, you know, really the lowest class of rural society, those in extreme poverty. However, he really painted them in a rather sympathetic way that's much more idealized and kind of softens the blow of the harsh subject matter in a way that Courbet absolutely never did. Um, so if you notice in Mie's work here on the right, the women's faces remain obscured, kind of uh, emphasizing their anonymity like Courbet's Stonebreakers does, um, but the women's bodies in Mie's composition are seemingly uh, kind of well-fed, they're strong, um, and their clothes are not, you know, dirty and torn and ratty. Um, really, the entire scene is rendered with a sort of softer, um, more soothing color palette, and he uses softer brushwork than Courbet. Um, and really, Mie also seems to sort of convey a greater sense of hope with this very sort of open horizon and the vast sky versus Courbet's sort of trapped location. Now, this work by Mie, it was exhibited in the 1857 Salon, where critics labeled it realist for its implicit social sort of criticism. Um, and images like this, well, like both of these, honestly, these really put the upper class on edge because by this point in time, France had already seen multiple revolutions, and so they really sort of feared further uprisings from the poor or the peasant classes. So some realists like Jean-Baptiste Camille Carreau took a more romantic, kind of less political approach than Courbet or Millet. So here in this work titled First Leaves Near Mantis from about 1855, Carreau depicts the peaceful beauty of nature and rural life on a spring morning in the woods. There's this nice sort of flowing rhythm created by the repeated irregular verticals of the trees, which starkly contrast with the feathery brushwork representing the green uh, undergrowth and the soft kind of yellow leaves. We've got this man and woman that pause on the road kind of near the center of the composition, kind of chatting um, for just a moment. And then we have another figure to the right kind of working in the brush or kind of in the woods there, maybe picking berries perhaps. Um, but again, Corot is kind of on the maybe quieter side, uh, the less political side of realism. And he conveys this scene as an appealing alternative to the increasingly crowded, dirty, and violent urban lifestyle. Rosa Bonheur is another artist who, in a lot of ways, falls on this sort of less political side of realism. And instead, she became one of the most popular French painters of animals and farm life. Um, born in 1822, Bonheur's parents were members of a radical utopian group that believed in the equality of sexes, and they actually believed in a future female messiah, so they were absolutely supportive of their daughter's interests in art. Um, and her father was also a drawing teacher, so he provided most of her artistic training. Um, Bonheur committed herself to the accurate depiction of modern draft animals, which were sort of quickly being replaced by new technological and industrial innovations. She studied zoology books and did detailed studies in stockyards and slaughterhouses, although to gain access to these all-male spaces, she had to get special police permission to dress as a man. Um, this particular work, titled The Horse Fair, was completed between about 1853 and 55. Um, she exhibited it 
at the salon upon its completion, and it won a first class medal and kind of launched her career forward. Uh, so the subject matter here was based on a real horse market in France where she had witnessed um, grooms parading these elegant Percheron horses before hopeful buyers. Um, but it's also partly inspired by the Parthenon marbles, which were already on display in London by this point, um, and by the work of the romantic artist Theodore Jericho. Um, and this is somewhat romantic with the sort of dynamic movements of the horses and how that seemingly implies this sense of maybe unrestrained freedom. And some have even kind of interpreted this as some sort of commentary on the lack of women's rights in the 1850s but it wasn't really perceived that way at the time. Instead, for its contemporary viewers, this was sort of conveying a sense of nostalgia for pre-industrial life and the monumental scale, because it's about, um, about eight feet by about 16 and a half feet. Uh, so the monumental scale kind of celebrates the heroic strength and beauty and grace of these animals. So the concept of modernity was also immensely appealing to French avant-garde artists, and many of them sought to convey this sort of experience of a very fast-paced, kind of ever-changing urban industrial lifestyle. In 1863, the poet and critic Charles Baudelaire published his essay titled The Painter of Modern Life, in which he encouraged artists to seek out and express that which was characteristic of the present modern moment, meaning they should seek out contemporary fashions, pastimes, and ideas and use that as their subject matter. Now, while some of these artists took a more conservative approach and remained within the traditions of the academic system, others really followed Baudelaire's call, especially in Paris in the 1860s and 70s. Perhaps the most significant of these artists was Edouard Manet. Manet was a relatively well-born Parisian and close friends with Baudelaire, and he is considered a realist because of his commitment to painting on a large scale and with truth the lower class and sort of marginalized uh, individuals of modern society, although he typically tends to depict more urban subjects than Corot. Um, so here we have a self-portrait that he did um, relatively early in his career, or I guess really right in the middle of his career, actually. Um, but what I've included here on the right is um, a work from about 1869 titled The Rag Picker. Um, and so this is kind of, you know, exemplary of Manet's commitment to realism. Um, he depicts the brutal reality of this man who's kind of among the poorest of the poor. Um, a rag picker would be sort of equivalent to maybe a person today who collected soda cans to trade in for a bit of cash. Um, the rag picker would go around collecting scraps of fabric and kind of textiles and materials and then he would sell them to seamstresses to patch clothing or maybe to people to use for stuffing for pillows things like that uh, but again it would just be for the tiniest bit of change Manet's success as a radical avant-garde modern artist was born from scandal, actually. Um, by Manet's time, the Académie des Beaux-Arts was still very much kind of in control of opportunities for artistic exhibition and sales. Um, salon exhibitions, however, were increasingly opened to non-academic artists, um, and that kind of resulted in a surge of submissions. In 1863, the jury rejected some 3,000 works, which caused an absolute uproar from artists, uh, so much so that the Emperor Napoleon III authorized an alternate exhibition for the rejections, which he called the Salon des Refusés, which kind of literally means the Salon of the Rejected Ones. Now, while this was intended to simply placate all of these angry artists, the Salon des Refusés ended up attracting huge crowds, and although they didn't like everything that they saw there, uh, the general public had been introduced to a lot of new sort of avant-garde art. 
So included in the 1863 Salon des Refusés was Edward Manet's Luncheon on the Grass, which really scandalized and provoked a mixture of criticism, shock, and bewilderment amongst contemporary viewers, including the emperor himself. So Luncheon on the Grass, which was originally titled The Bath, was rejected at the 1863 Salon by jurors who were appalled by its nudity and its crude technique. Um, Manet depicts two bourgeoisie men having a sort of suburban picnic with two women. Um, one of them is completely nude, and the other in the background is sort of scantily clad. Now let me remind you that Cabanel's Birth of Venus was accepted to and met with great success at the 1863 Salon, um, whereas the nudity in Manet's work was considered scandalous. Why? Well, that's because Manet has rejected the accepted convention of presenting nudity, specifically female nudity, in a very highly idealized manner, uh, disguised as a mythological goddess um, in a sort of timeless classical setting. Instead, he depicts shockingly unidealized women and recognizably modern Parisian men in contemporary clothing. Um, his audience kind of easily condemned the women's nudity here, um, assuming that these were meant to be prostitutes with their clients, and so they criticized this painting as immoral. Uh, some scholars have even sort of interpreted the presence of this small kind of pool or pond of rather cloudy water as being symbolic of these women's um, impurity or promiscuity. Now, Manet here references um, several important works of art from the past, which is something that academic artists were expected to do, yet he kind of synthesizes those references with an undeniable sense of modernity in this intentional kind of provocative effort to update the great masters with this dose of modern realism and to kind of prove that modern subjects could be just as timeless as classical ones. So Manet really greatly admired Giorgione, and he traveled to Venice to see his Tempesta, and he has seemingly developed an interest in kind of teasing his viewers with this intentionally ambiguous narrative that um, seems to, you know, offer some kind of uh, interesting, you know, story, but it doesn't really give you any answers to your questions, um, which is very sort of similar to what Georgion did with his, um, his sort of poetry paintings. Manet also studied and copied artworks at the Louvre, including Titian's pastoral concert, and he seems to be appropriating pretty directly the dynamic between Titian's figures into his luncheon here. Um, he also used uh, the Cabinet de Estampes at the Biblioteca Nacional to see um, Marc Antonio Raimondi's print, The Judgment of Paris, uh, which was actually made after a 16th century painting by Raphael. Um, and so if you notice, uh, Manet has appropriated uh, quite directly this kind of figural grouping, or at least the positions of this figural group, um, into his luncheon. Um, but where Raphael and therefore Raimondi's work uh, was sort of based on classical depictions of river gods and nymphs, um, Manet depicts the seedier side of modern urban life in a style that was sort of equally shocking to contemporary viewers. So the stark artificial light illuminates Manet's forms, which he's sort of rendered with large separate brush strokes and an overall loose handling of paint that contemporary viewers felt was unfinished. 
Manet has also reduced his use of linear perspective and proper proportions, so there are purposeful spatial distortions. Um, for example, the woman in the background is sort of out of scale as she reaches down to the water, um, but she nearly sort of touches the thumb of this man in the foreground here. Um, also, minimal shadows and cool tones flatten the figures and the surrounding space, and it kind of makes them look like um, cutouts that have been posed in front of a painted backdrop. Um, the boldly outlined nude figure here, um, she was based on a well-known model named Victorine, um, and Manet has used almost no chiaroscuro, kind of denying us the expected soft sensuality of her flesh, um, and instead of having a rather submissive gaze or maybe being coy and flirty, um, she confidently meets the viewer's gaze as if to say, I know exactly what you're looking at. Um, she sort of challenges the viewer, and her boldness, which is echoed by Manet's bold style, really sort of subverts the tradition of the female nude as an object and kind of strips back the layers of stereotypes to reveal um, this, you know, non-idealized modern depiction of humanity and femininity. Um, Manet is really purposefully being provocative here, um, and he's kind of challenging the authorities and conventions of art making and society by presenting contemporary subjects and refusing to tell a clear story, instead allowing his viewers to sort of interpret it on their own and really reflect upon themselves, uh, their attitudes, and their perspectives. Another of Manet's most successful and scandalous works is also from 1863 and is titled Olympia. Um, so here again, he's pulling from art history to sort of make a modern social commentary. However, he's also deliberately challenging conventions of both the art academy and society. Uh, the title Olympia refers to a character in a contemporary novel and play uh, who was a socially ambitious prostitute. And the name Olympia was um, relatively common or kind of popular for prostitutes in 19th century France in general. So Manet has kind of adapted the tradition of the reclining female nude here, and we know that he would copied Titian's Venus of Urbino on an earlier trip uh, to Florence, um, and so he's almost paying homage to that here by appropriating the subject in the composition. But Manet has really stripped away the veil of mythology that Titian employs, and instead he presents another sort of shockingly modern figure in a very recognizably contemporary setting. Olympia is modeled again on um, the woman named Victorine, and she's shown reclining on this bed in a very similar pose to Titian's Venus, um, but Olympia wears these trendy slippers and a gold bangle and this stark black choker and has this uh, kind of soft pink flower tucked behind her ear. But for all their similarities, Manet's Olympia is really the antithesis of Titian's Venus, where Venus is a highly idealized depiction of feminine beauty, her soft, curvaceous figure kind of rendered with delicate chiaroscuro and warm, rich colors, um, and her flirtatious gaze at the viewer from, you know, this slightly kind of lower point of view. Um, Olympia is instead this very angular and flattened figure with a bold black outline around her harsh, cold flesh. Manet really uses just the faintest of shadows to just barely model the figure. Um, and although her pose is essentially the same as Venus's, Olympia is clearly more rigid or tense, and she stares defiantly at the viewer from a slightly elevated position rather than a lower submissive one. Um, the dark, shallow space of the room behind her presses the woman forward into the viewer's space, uh, maybe to create a greater sense of intimacy, but it also sort of creates um, this sense of entrapment, sort of similar to uh, Courbet's Stonebreakers. 
Uh, Manet also replaces the puppy from Titian's painting with a black cat, um, which is sort of arching its back and, and seeming like it's just been, you know, spooked or something. Um, and so at the time, critics of this work associated the black cat with witchcraft and sexual promiscuity. Um, Manet also transforms Titian's two servants into a single black servant who approaches with a bouquet of flowers, presumably a gift for Olympia from an upper class client. Um, this servant was modeled after a woman named Laure, who posed for Manet several different times. Um, since the abolition of slavery in France in 1845, there was a growing working class, uh, sort of a growing working class um, black population, and many had settled in Manet's neighborhood. Um, and so in his notebooks, uh, the artist refers to Laure as a very beautiful black woman, um, but as an artist, he really, he exaggerates her racial identity much less than some of his contemporaries did. Um, Laura's appearance as a servant in this scene is mostly a, alluding to modern Paris's changing population and not so much about it being, you know, exotic. Um, in fact, some have argued that the black servant is here kind of in a clean white dress um, and she's clearly meant to be more than just a common maid, um, and she sort of commands almost as much pictorial space and attention as the reclining figure in the foreground. Um, and so this is potentially something that fueled the painting's controversy even further at the time. Manet was kind of insistent on unmasking both artistic and social illusions. He refuses to pretend that this is anything but paint on canvas, depicting the harsh reality of these contemporary working class women. Although the jury accepted Olympia to the Salon of 1865, the painting provoked extensive critical condemnation for its impudent display of a self-assured uh, kind of female depiction of sexuality and its seemingly awkward technique as well as the apparent mockery of um, past art traditions. When it was displayed at the 1865 Salon, it was really vilified by conservative critics and it received jeers and disdain from audience members. Ultimately, guards had to be stationed next to it for its protection until it could be moved to a higher location above a doorway where it was out of reach. So just two years later, in 1867, Manet was rejected from the salon completely. He followed in the footsteps of Courbet and rented a nearby spot to stage his own exhibition, asserting his independence as an avant-garde artist. This made him a role model or an unofficial leader of a younger generation of forward-thinking artists and writers who often gathered at the Café Grubois in the Montmartre district of Paris. This group would follow Manet's lead in challenging academic conventions and develop into what we now know as the Impressionists. Manet worked closely with these artists, although he never exhibited with them or considered himself to be an Impressionist. But he did often paint similar themes, such as scenes of modern urban life and leisure, um, but he did sort of maintain a dedication to social and political commentary in a way that the Impressionists never did. And Manet's later style does become um, sort of more painterly, presumably as he was experiencing the quick kind of gestural brushwork used by the younger Impressionists to convey a sense of the very spontaneous, fast-paced nature of modern life. So, for example, this work, uh, which is titled A Bar at the Follet Berger, um, it's from about 1881 or 82, and it really uses much more painterly sort of unfinished brushstrokes to depict um, this very particular bar at a well-known expensive nightclub in Paris that was famous for having numerous entertainment acts at once, including live music, dancing, and a circus act. Um, if you notice, um, you can see the legs of a trapeze artist kind of dangling in the upper left corner here. 
Um, but the focus of Manet's composition isn't the entertainment, though, and it's not even the upper-class patrons. Uh, rather, it's the young barmaid serving drinks. Um, so she's shown um, right in the center of the composition, and she seems to be a relatively hard-working girl. Her face is flushed, and her hands look to be quite raw. Um, but she also seems rather stiff and even somewhat detached from this intricate scene. The composition itself is strangely ambiguous. Um, what initially appears to be a sort of open room on the opposite side of the bar behind the woman is actually a reflection in a large mirror along the wall. So all of this in the background is sort of meant to be um, the reflection of the room that is, I guess, directly behind the viewer. Um, but in that reflection, the viewer's perspective is somewhat distorted. Um, if you notice, the girl or the woman's uh, reflection is kind of off to the side instead of directly behind her, even though we seem to be standing directly in front of her. Um, and in the reflection, she is shown talking to um, this man who has come up to the bar, but we don't see him in the real scene. Maybe that's meant to be the viewer's reflection, so we are him, but even then the perspective is still sort of off. Um, also, in the reflection, the man and the woman both sort of lean forward towards each other, but the real woman is standing um, sort of rigidly upright with this expression that really communicates her discomfort or maybe boredom or maybe even a sort of depression. Um, now, at this time, there would have been this sort of assumption that a working class woman tending bar like this would have also offered other more um, illicit services to her customers. So there's maybe this implication that she is just another object behind the bar for sale. Um, if you notice, we have this reputation of triangles throughout the space. Um, we have like a triangular chandelier kind of here in the background. We also have the um, absinthe bottle here in the foreground. Her body, um, her body itself kind of makes a triangular form. We have the triangle of her coat here. Um, but more specifically, notice that um, several of these liquor bottles on the bar are stamped with a red triangular logo. Um, Manet here is referencing the logo of the Brass Brewery, which had been trademarked in um, Britain in 1876, just six years before he painted this. So he's um, referencing contemporary events and goods, but also notice with the inclusion of this triangle of red flowers pinned to her chest here. Manet has sort of stamped the woman with this logo as well, um, again marking her out as a consumable object just like all the rest of these things. So he's thinking about the concept of sexualized looking, um, the male gaze, and he's thinking about class relationships here, kind of acknowledging that both the barmaid's gender and her social status expose her to visual and sexual consumption, to manipulation and exploitation by her upper class, especially male clientele. And he's also implying that she, too, is fully aware of and certainly not thrilled by her situation. This was really Manet's last major work before his death in 1883, and he presented it at the 1882 Salon. Manet is generally considered less a political rebel than Courbet and some of the others. However, he was undoubtedly a highly influential avant-garde artist from the middle class and absolutely a realist with his ideas that art should reflect the present kind of modern moment um, it should reflect modern subjects and it should offer social commentary. 
Variations of French realism appeared in other nations after about 1850 as the social effects of urbanization and industrialization spread. In general, these other artists didn't label themselves realists, but they were equally interested in presenting unflinching looks at reality that exposed the difficult lives of the working poor and the complexities of urban living. In Russia, a version of this realism developed in the 1860s and 70s after the Tsar abolished serfdom and emancipated Russia's peasants from aristocratic control. A group of painters quickly expressed their support to the peasant cause, as well as their desires for freedom from the constraints of the St. Petersburg Academy of Art and their commitment to socially useful realism. They brought art to the people using traveling exhibitions, and so they referred to themselves as the Wanderers. Ilya Repin joined the Wanderers in 1878 after attending the St. Petersburg Art Academy and studying in Paris. This work, titled Bar Callers on the Volga, is one of the series <clears throat> excuse me, one of a series of works that illustrates prevalent social injustices in Russia and was intended as a sort of call to action. Here, Repin presents a group of peasants performing the backbreaking work of pulling ships up the Volga River. The men are dirty and obviously exhausted, but at the center of the composition, Repin includes this younger boy who seems um, quite new, and even still bewildered by the type of this work, but there's a clear sense that he'll soon be just as worn out as his companions. And so Repin really sort of pleads with his viewer, emphasizing that if they don't step up and do something about these injustices, future generations will continue to suffer the same fates. In the United States, realism wasn't applied as a term or artistic label. However, it was a long-standing artistic tradition that had been established with colonial portrait painters. Several kinds of realism existed in later 19th century American art, including some with a political edge and some that simply depicted unconventional subject matter in uncompromising ways. One of the most well-known American realists was Thomas Aikens. Aikens was born in Philadelphia, and the city remained important in his artworks for much of his career. He was a student at the first American Art Academy, the Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Arts, but he felt their anatomical training um, was sort of lacking, and so he supplemented his own training with studies at the nearby Jefferson Medical College. Um, then he later enrolled in the École des Beaux-Arts arts in Paris and spent six months studying um, Baroque art in Spain after that. When he returned to Philadelphia in 1870, he specialized in Frank portraits and scenes of everyday life, but they weren't all that popular amongst the general public. In 1876, he was hired as a teacher at the Pennsylvania Academy, and by 1882, he had been appointed as director. However, he disapproved of the conventional academic technique of drawing from plaster casts, saying, quote, at best, they are only imitations, and an imitation of an imitation cannot have so much life as an imitation of nature itself. The Greeks did not study the antique. The draped figures in the Parthenon pediment were modeled from life undoubtedly, end quote. Aikens promoted the study of anatomy through drawing from life, photography, and the observation of dissection instead of classical nude figure studies. His style has sometimes been dubbed scientific realism because of his uncompromising desire to portray honest, accurate details. He was inspired by Edward Muybridge's studies of horses and humans in motion, and so he created his own studies, which superimposed several exposures of a walking and a jumping man onto single negatives and then these really helped him kind of understand human anatomy um, in a better way that he could apply in his paintings. Um, he would also project photographs onto his canvases and sort of trace figures and shift objects around to make a more harmonious composition. However, his teaching methods were considered controversial because they deviated from tradition, and so in 1886, he was forced to resign from the academy altogether. 
Aiken's most controversial painting was his 1875 work titled The Gross Clinic, which was created specifically for the 1876 Philadelphia Centennial Exhibition, but because the jury felt it was a subject unfit for the fine art show, he was shuffled over to the scientific and medical display. Aiken's large canvas depicts the local physician, Dr. Samuel David Gross, overseeing a surgery and lecturing to a class of medical students, including Aikens himself at the far right, who is sketching the scene. Um, here he's making a direct art historical reference uh, to Rembrandt's Anatomy Lesson of Dr. Tulp, um, and he's sort of making a similar effort to emphasize scientific um, scientific innovation and achievement. Now at this point in time, surgeons, especially teaching surgeons, were sort of feared as inhumane beings who used the poor as objects to practice on. And this was an idea highlighted by the reaction that Aikens has included um, from the woman on the lower left here, um, probably meant to be a relative of the patient. She sort of cringes in horror at the bloody procedure in front of her. Um, Aikens kind of focuses on the heroism of the surgeons who are performing um, this, this surgery. He illuminates Dr. Gross's face and his bloody hand that wields the scalpel. And then the strong, clear light kind of highlights the patient quite prominently. However, Aikens dehumanizes him by presenting only a portion of his leg and a little bit of his rear and his socked feet here, and then just a jumble of sheets. Um, and instead, he kind of emphasizes the attentive skill of all the other doctors who are working um, here. Um, so Aiken's goal here was really to celebrate um, scientific achievement and to document the medical procedures and advancements of his time. Um, and in this case, he has actually recorded a surgical innovation that allowed Dr. Gross to save the patient's leg, um, which previously would have simply been amputated. One of Aiken's star pupils at the Pennsylvania Academy was a young African-American painter named Henry Osawa Tanner. Tanner was from a roughly middle-class family. His father was a bishop. Um, and after studying under Aikens, he worked as a photographer and drawing teacher in Atlanta before moving to Paris in 1891 to further his artistic training. He painted scenes of African-American and rural French life that combined Aikens' realism with a delicate brushwork he adapted while studying in France, and he ultimately became the most successful African-American painter of the late 19th and early 20th centuries. With works like this, um, which is titled The Banjo Lesson from 1893, Tanner sought to counter the prevalent stereotypes and caricatures of African-American life presented by other artists and provide a more realistic human look into the lives of these people who were incredibly marginalized by both uh, their race and their poverty. Um, here, an elderly man teaches a young boy to play the banjo. Like with Courbet's Stonebreakers, we have this scene of knowledge and skill being passed between generations. Um, and Tanner's two figures are really sort of connected by their seriousness and their concentration. Now the use of the banjo here is significant because the instrument was associated with minstrel shows, which um, were a form of racist derogatory theater which developed in early 19th century America. Um, and so these were shows that were performed by mostly white actors wearing blackface makeup uh, for the purpose of comically portraying racial stereotypes of African Americans. Um, so in the banjo lesson, Tanner's desire to show us his vision of the resilience and spiritual grace and creative and intellectual promise of post-Civil War African Americans is fully realized. The scene is staged within the small confines of a log cabin with the cool glow of a hearth fire casting the scene's only light source from the right corner, enveloping the man and the boy in this rectangular pool of light across the floor. The boy holds the banjo in both hands, his downward gaze a reflection of his focused concentration on his grandfather's instructions. 
The older man holds the banjo up gently with his left hand so that the boy is not overtaken by its weight, yet the staging shows us that the man wants the boy to come into the realization of the music and its rewards through his own intuition and hard work. The contrast between the man's age and the boy's adds to the narrative um, and kind of a, adds a sense of tension maybe, kind of this counterpoint between age and experience and youth and maybe the promise of the future or of achievement. The boy is really bathed in the glow of the fire's warmth with this glimmer of white light shining across his forehead, the center of knowledge and understanding. The older man is submerged in cool shadows um, in kind of the rear of the room. And so this carefully orchestrated play of warm and cool, of shadow and light, it conveys that the success of future generations is built upon the legacy of previous ones. Bathed in the muted cool tones of gray and blue, the grandfather is the past, the old America of slavery and the civil war, of oppression, racism, and poverty, while the boy, caught in the warm glow of the fire's light, is the new America of renewed opportunities, advancement, education, and new beginnings. Here's one final American realist, this time the sculptor Edmonia Lewis. Lewis was born in New York in 1845 to a Chippewa mother and an African-American father, but she was orphaned at the age of four and raised by her mother's family. She attended Oberlin College, the first college in the United States to give women degrees, before moving to Boston where she sold busts and medallions of Civil War heroes and abolitionist leaders to pay her way to Rome where, in 1867, she joined a group of American sculptors working in the neoclassical style, although Lewis tended to use that more to address um, modern kind of realist concerns. Um, Lewis created this work titled Forever Free in 1867 as an sort of memorial to um, the Emancipation Proclamation of 1862 and 63. She shows a sort of demure woman kneeling in gratitude next to her standing male companion who props his foot on the ball and chain that once bound his ankles and raises his hand in a gesture of liberation that highlights the broken shackle around his wrist. However, this is not only a celebration of um, freedom for American slaves. It also reflects white attitudes towards women and people of color at the time. If you notice, the female figure is um, sort of less racialized and more submissive than the male figure. Um, and so Lewis has sort of aligned her with contemporary ideals of womanhood um, so that she's more appealing to white audiences.